Welcome to the CCFR Radio Podcast, your source for news, updates, and stories from the CCFR. Hey everybody, welcome to episode 8 of the CCFR Radio Podcast. I'm your host, Rod Yeltaka. Thanks for listening in. Uh, Today we've got a ton of CCFR updates and a lot of firearms-related news to talk about, as you probably all already know. So it will be a a big episode. As a result, I won't be doing any other segments this time around uh, other than a CCFR update and CCFR news just because there's just too much to cover, which is, I guess, a good thing for content, bad thing for the types of things that we have to cover. So let's get the show on the road right after this. Hunters and sports shooters have a lot more in common than they think. Politicians and bureaucrats will never stop pushing toward their vision of Canada where only the police and the military have firearms. All gun owners need to stand together. An attack on one is an attack on us all. Let these people know they do not have your consent. Stand up for your own ability to own and use firearms. Donate now or become a member of the CCFR at www.firearmrights.ca. A CCFR update. Welcome back, everybody. Some update items at the CCFR. As you may know, we had just sent out a newsletter, as we do probably every three months, nowhere near often enough. Some people have told us that we need to send out more newsletters and and stay in touch with uh, with uh, our people in the firearms community. Uh, well said, but it takes it's a lot of work to gather all that information and send it out. And uh, you know, this small group of people that we have can't, we can't constantly uh, do everything. So we have expanded our volunteer base as far as the newsletter is concerned. So look forward to seeing a few more of those, which are very useful. Um, But then of course we have the podcast, which is like an audio newsletter that you can listen to in the car. Or now I've started to uh, upload the CCFR radio podcast to YouTube. Unfortunately, YouTube, you guys might, might've noticed YouTube is uh, very sensitive when it comes to copyright infringement now um the old episode six got pulled down and i put a new episode six um up just taking out one song so most times when you have copyright uh infractions if you want to call them that what will happen is they'll monetize your video because i don't really monetize uh the ccfr stuff i certainly don't monetize it on the the civil advantage channel and i sometimes monetize it uh, for this, for the CCFR on behalf of the CCFR on the on their own channel, um, but anyway, one of the videos was actually prohibited, and that's when someone has copyrighted material and they prohibit the video from even being shown. That's very rare. Usually, what they'll do is they'll monetize your video for you and they'll split the earnings with the people that made the copyright claim. So anyway, all that to say, I've re-uploaded another version of episode six, which is now you know the back catalog, as it were. Um, and hopefully that doesn't get taken down. So you guys can check that out. Cause I, you know, as far as the bumper music being real music from real artists rather than, uh, royalty free canned stuff, I, you know, I think it sounds better. So I'm willing to uh, put up with the, uh, copyright stuff. Anyway, uh, having said that a couple of items to note in the newsletter. So I wanted to chat real quick with you guys about this. I made a video uh, about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago, and it was a little bit rough. It was, um, posted in the in the uh, Facebook group. And I think I mentioned this video before. And I have to say it's, it was rough in both that I recorded in while I was driving, but also I had to deal out some hard truth and it's, that's tough, right? And the hard truth thing, it can be good. Uh, people can take that as a positive and go, you know, and say, yeah, yeah, you know what, you're probably right. And we need to change the way that we do this, that, or the other thing. Or some people are just like, I don't like to be lectured and I don't like to be lectured. So, (laughs) so I understand that as well. But uh, the subject matter, uh, being a little sensitive to some gun owners, and of course that's you know directly, uh, it was directly concerning two things, which is the overwhelming majority of gun owners do not support firearm groups whatsoever, and that's got to change if we're going to move forward as a as a community, and of course the division that some uh, the seeds of division that some sow in our community, and they they seem to think that that's the best possible thing they can do, while of course. Uh, demonstrating that they have other problems other than their their firearm problems, uh, possibly mental or emotional problems, and can't see past it to realize they're actually just damaging their own position. So, you know, these are tough things to talk about. And what I did want to say about this was 
Uh, I was really amazed at the positive reaction from our community. So I'm really honored to be associated with um, just such a, a large group of of largely honorable and and insightful people. So that was really great. And it did have the effect. We had a lot of people get involved with the CCFR that hadn't been involved previously. So that was a great thing. And also the people that have been involved the whole time uh, just elevated their um their involvement so really appreciate the support everybody so that's great now speaking of the newsletter i we sent out that newsletter i opened it up myself and i look through it because i don't do the newsletter right and i have to say i'm just when i look at it when i zoom out because i'm not in i'm not involved in you know everything at the ccfr in fact when i say i'm not even involved like i don't even know because i have my own <laughs> life to administrate and i've taken on a bunch of things like the podcast and and promotional stuff and the and some of the leadership aspects and whatever. So I'm not always involved in everything. And I just kind of looked at it as a newsletter coming from a firearm organization in Canada and comparing it to just kind of what's happened in the past. And I, I looked at this one newsletter and went, wow, you know, the CCFR is involved in a lot of stuff. And I think if you've received the newsletter, you'd probably agree that for one newsletter, for all that stuff to be, you know, original, you know, things, uh, you know, created and, and done and action taken by the CCFR is really impressive. So I'm proud of the whole group. I just, I know I'm kind of gushing about all of our volunteers and all the people involved, but I just, like I said, I just really, uh, really impressed to, and, and happy to be involved with such people. So anyway, having, uh, having said that as well, a lot of good stuff. So for example, we released uh, all three of those explainer videos. I had mentioned this in the podcast before, but this now came out in the newsletter. So hopefully a lot of people will see those videos. I think they're, I think they're really good. And, and I will always remind people, guys, don't forget if you get into a gun debate uh, for whatever reason, and as you know, there's a, there's a big gun debate that's already started and it's going to be raging over the next few weeks. Use the explainer videos to hammer your points home. That's why we made them. That's why we expended that's why I expended all that effort. And that's why the CCFR expended all that money because we wanted tools to say, oh, firearm registration, you think that's a good idea? That's going to stop multiple victim public shootings? Bam, there's the link. Watch this and tell me your comments, mic drop. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's what they're for. So get them out there, hammer people over the head with them. That's what they're, that's what they're for. So anyway, all uh, the rest of those are out. One more point I wanted to make about the explainer videos. One of them went viral and I think it was probably Reddit. I'm not sure. Um, but I'm going to make this really, really brief. Uh, so I think it was the ban all guns, you know, for public safety or ban all guns. It's the right thing to do or something like that. And as you guys probably know, being the insightful and, and attentive folks that you are, some of the ideological videos that we did in the explainer series series were titled. And the first few sentences of the videos were to entice people that didn't know anything about guns or had a neutral or they were undecided position or even an anti-gunner would go, oh yeah, here's here's a safe space for me. Here's a video that uh, that aligns with with my opinion. And then they start watching it, and then, and then they get, you know, they get hammered over the head with facts and logic. It's actually a pro-gun video. Well, anyway, um, this video got went viral. I actually had to turn the comments off because it had like 700 comments from like the dregs of the internet. Um, you know, just. Like, I can't even explain the comments because I don't want to start swearing on the podcast all the time, but just the most vitri vitriolic, you know, knuckle dragging, you know, you know, just cursing and name calling. It's just the worst possible comments. Something you'd see on, you know, whatever, on, on, on another video of another topic kind of thing. And it just became completely obvious that none of these people, like literally thousands of these guys uh, or girls for that matter, didn't even watch the video. They saw the title and they're like, I need to be heard. I'm not even going to watch it. Even though other people are commenting, guys, this is a pro gun video and it's really slick because it's fooling people into watching it. You know, you've got it wrong. And they're like, no, this is an anti gun. You know, you'll never take my guns. There was even somebody that said, if you try to take my AR 15, I'll kill you with it. Yeah. Super, super crazy stuff. Now, knowing what I know, being in the firearms community for a while, the overwhelming majority of people that even comment on this stuff don't even own guns. A lot of them aren't even old enough to own guns. They're just there just being just, just yeah, being, being who they are being trolls. So anyway, I, the comment that I know it's, it's kind of rambling, but the comment that I wanted to make was I actually had to turn off the comments because I didn't want people. I didn't want the people who were commenting to represent gun owners. 
So let's say I, uh, we were successful in getting some anti-gun folks or some undecided to go watch the videos. They scroll down to see if there's information in the comments and they see this. And they're like, yeah, this is why people can't have guns. So I was, I was pretty embarrassed. I don't think a lot of them were gun owners, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is the exact opposite of what the CCFR does. So anyway, yeah, one of them went viral. I think we ended up with somewhere around 60,000 views on one of those videos. But uh, uh, other than that, check those out. They, uh, I think they, they, they work quite well for, for their intent, which is to fool people into thinking it's, a, it's an anti-gun video and they get in there and they get hit over the head with logic. So uh, spread those around best you can. Uh, next thing, I will also mention the podcast itself. So the podcast is in the newsletter and it's going, it's going great. Um, we don't have hard analytics at this point, but it seems like we have about 2000 people listening per episode so far. So, you know, and we've just gotten started. So I'm really excited about that. I'm really proud of that. And I'm, I'm really happy that people are listening in to get their, uh, get their information and they're enjoying it. So, um, you know, mission accomplished as far as that's concerned. Uh, I hope that I can continue to have the time to do it. And uh, I've got, I'm lining up other people to do, um, to contribute to the CCFR radio podcast. So it's not always me talking. Um, so anyway, look forward to more of that stuff and make sure you, sh you share this because on a lot of these podcasts, there's a lot of really good information and we want to get as many people listening as humanly possible. So don't forget to share the podcast and I appreciate everybody that's listening so far. Next, another data dump has been made into the CCFR ATIP vault. So there's a ton of information in there already. Um, there's new information that has that continues to be received and gets put in there all the time. And I think uh, Tracy Wilson has been doing that stuff. And I think she just dumped in a bunch of uh, stuff concerning uh, correspondence between the infamous um, uh, Canadian Coalition for Gun Control and also the, um, uh, the uh, CFAC, the Canadian Firearms Advisory Committee. So there's a bunch of ATIP uh, internal communication there. So that's great for people that want to really kind of look into that stuff and try to dig up some gems there. We're, we're going to continue to host tons and tons of information in the ATIP vault. So look forward to that. So let's wrap, um, let's wrap up the uh, update portion and move on to news. But I will say there's a lot to, more to come from the CCFR in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I'm also going to, I've made arrangements uh, with Tracy Wilson to get uh, Bob Zimmer to join me on the next podcast to explain uh, Bill C-47 because he's definitely the expert. I'm not the expert on that bill, but I'm going to actually have Tracy Wilson in the next segment, uh, in the new segment, come in and explain Bill C-47 and some uh, some updates from the Hill because she was there doing a little bit of lobbying this uh, past week as well. So stay tuned for the news right after this. There are politicians and bureaucrats in Canada who believe honest, hard-working Canadians cannot be trusted with firearms. These people will stop at nothing to make sure they are the only ones who can possess them. Let them know you don't consent to their ongoing campaign against you. Stand up for your own ability to own and use firearms, now and for generations to come. Donate or become a member of the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights by visiting us at www.firearmrights.ca. And now, the news on CCFR Radio. Okay, we're here with Tracy Wilson of the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights. And Tracy's going to give us a quick, quick update of Bill C-47, which I don't understand too well myself. So I'll be listening along and also uh, her most recent lobbying activity. So let's, uh, let's go ahead, Tracy. Hi, Rod. Thanks for having me on. So <clears throat> C-47, there's a, there, it's a big bill. There's a lot to it. Um, besides the fact that many of the key players in the gun industry worldwide have not signed on, there's also been no consultation with lawful gun owners like hunters and sports shooters. So these people will be caught within the confines of the measures of this bill. All gun purchases and transactions will need to be recorded by law in a standard digital recording format. These will be retained for seven years and the minister could request them at any time. This is where you get the creation of a backdoor registry of sorts, but on a global level. Um, Bob Zimmer has been working very hard on this, um, calling it a backdoor registry. Each country within the confines of this treaty will have latitude within the records, but they will have access to it. 
yesterday in debate at the House, Aaron O'Toole requested that an explicit exemption be made for lawful use by hunters and sport, sport shooters. And he called the fact that there was no exemption in this a lack um, uh, a failure of the treaty itself. The practical reality is that we already have a strong system of arms control in this country that achieves the stated objectives of the treaty. And I think signing it, you know, is just a means to appease the UN. Um, the other conditions that we should be considering are the costs of implementing something like this. Um, an infrastructure for a data, a global database. Uh, there's no measured number for it as of yet. Another problem um, is the fact that just like criminals don't register their guns in Canada, gun runners won't be filling out permits at the border. So we're, we've already got exactly what we need, the controls in place um, under the Trade Control Bureau. And they're, you know, really it's useless legislation. Hmm. Well, yeah. that's useless, le useless legislation as it applies to firearms. That's, uh, that's weird. I wonder what's going on with the government right now. <laughs> well, it's become the norm, right? Um, yeah, speaking of useless legislation, uh, I did spend the afternoon yesterday at the House of Commons. I started off with a visit with public safety. Um, there's been an increase in pressure from the Coalition for Gun Control surrounding the shooting event in Vegas. Uh, they're asking for, of course, more, you know, more gun control measures. Um this is uh, the response from Goodale on this is that he is sticking to his platform uh, promises. There was uh, on their mandate, there were some policy points that he had outlined. Some of them are happening. Some of them haven't happened. Some of them are actually already existed. There was one point on there that I'm really excited since he did promise, you know, officially and publicly yesterday that he will be completing all the policy points on his mandate. There's one on there in particular that really interests me, and I think as as a whole, Canadians will support this from coast to coast, and that is the promise of $100 million to the provinces to sink into their guns and gangs units. So this would provide LEO with the resources they need to literally fight crime at the street level, um, you know, and, and develop their programming. So, you know, Goodale did say yesterday that he will be sticking to that mandate and the policy points will be um, provided for by the end of their tenure. So I'm really excited because uh, as far as I remember, the last budget, it was uh, passed in the House of Commons and it's been implemented and there was no allowance for this policy point. So I'm not sure if he's donating the $100 million, but apparently we're going to go ahead with that. So that that in itself is good news. I think we should hold him to account on that. So as, as we talked about before, um, you can't really reach into the budget and grab $100 million. I mean, the budget's set. So if you look at their, their platform uh, from the election and Goodale's recent promise to implement it, um, the one measure in the entire platform that would have a, um, an effect on public safety, a positive effect, uh, they're not going to do. And then everything else that just affects, you know, people driving their <laughs> license, don't gun owners driving their restricted firearms to the range and stuff. Those are getting implemented. I mean, this is Absolutely. upside. Yeah, it's upside down yeah. land as usual, right. right? Back to paper ATTs. Um, you know, we've got um, probably a couple million people in Canada in peaceful possession of a firearm without a license. Uh, that amnesty that the Tories have renewed for oh, almost over eight years now, I believe, that amnesty ends on December 21st of this year. So starting January 1st, um, they will be criminals. So um, there, there's going to be a provision implemented for that. Um, the details have not been released yet, but I, you know, it, it's still concentrating on the people who, you know, grandpa living up in the mountains somewhere with a shotgun um, would now be a criminal, of course. Right. And meanwhile, we're still not doing the hard work on crime. So <clears throat> it's a little frustrating, um, but it is hard work and it, it takes it takes a great deal of resources, topic knowledge and expertise to do this type of work. They are still also looking at the UN marking scheme. I know it's been deferred. Big shout out to everybody in the community for working on that. Um, but they are still have their um, target date of December 2018 to implement the UN marking scheme, which is funny because the UN Small Arms Treaty is already able to uh, register firearms with their unique identifier, which of course we all know is the serial number. It already exists on the firearm. 
So that in itself just shows how useless the UN marking itself would be. We don't need it. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's a little bit silly. Now, when <clears throat> when I was done my meeting with public safety, I uh, I went over and had a little visit with uh, MP Michelle Rempel. We've got some work to do, so we had a meeting there, and then I attended question period just to kind of gauge the climate. Um, things are a little tense right now with the activities that happen in Vegas. Horrific, horrific activities. There was surprisingly void of mention of gun control in QP, which is good for now. Um, you know, they're, they're, they did stand and acknowledge um, the first responders and pay tribute to those who lost their lives. Um, but there, there was no call out for gun control right yet. So that's good. And I've got a request in to sit down with Pierre Polhus. He is the MP who was just appointed the new official public safety opposition critic. So he's got a big file and uh, we're going to gauge where he is on the, you know, the firearms end of it. Um, there's a lot that's encompassed under his purview, but I'd like to sit down and discuss his, uh, his feelings about the firearms file and, you know, create a really good working relationship with him. So Super busy fall, juggling all these lobby activities, and of course, hunting season's around the corner, but uh, lots going on, and stay tuned for even more in this short future. That sounds great. Well, I appreciate the update. I'm sure the members of the CCFR appreciate it. Um, Don't forget, uh, share the podcast everywhere you can. It's a really great way to keep up to, you know, with what's going on at the CCFR, and there's always new stuff uh, coming up. In fact, I've got things that we can't cover here in this episode coming up in the next episode. So always, uh, always lots going on. So I appreciate that, Tracy. And uh, we're going to come back in a moment with the news and we will see you guys soon. Over the past 25 years, tens of thousands of Canadians have had their firearms taken by no fault of their own through arbitrary reclassifications, paperwork errors or senseless prohibitions. The government's perfect vision of Canada does not include you or your firearms. Let Canada's politicians and bureaucrats know they do not have your consent. Stand up for your own ability to own and use firearms by joining the CCFR right now at www.firearmrights.ca. All right, well, let's continue on with the news. Now, um, I'm sure everybody can uh, they can guess what we're going to talk about next. We're going to talk about the shooting in Las Vegas. Now, I'm not going to cover like the news items or the facts on the ground or whatever. I mean, you can you can research that self uh, or research that stuff for yourself on the Internet. And there's you know, exhaustive coverage and exhaustive uh, um, YouTube videos on it. But what I want to talk about is one aspect of this whole issue that is, well, it's here now. And what that is, is. When there's a shooting in the United States, what happens is you have gun control people here in Canada um, that get very motivated to punish licensed gun owners for that shooting in another country. And that happens every single time. I went through that extensively. Last time there was a big shooting, which was the Orlando nightclub shooting. And I think I did, you know, three three different interviews and one of them was even hostile. <laughs> but, I, you know, it you know, I do my best to stay calm with these people, but they just are completely irrational and hysterical and frothing at the mouth and wanting to associate people that have a firearms license that go hunting or sports shooting or plinking out there in the forest with their with their kids or grandpas and grandmas taking their, their children to, you know, out to the back 40 in the farm and, and shooting cans or gophers that are ripping up their fields. And, you know, they want to make a connection between these people and multiple victim public shooting um, perpetrators and it just drives me nuts but it's something that we have to deal with so anyway uh, as you guys know we didn't make any comments in the wake of the shooting because it's just not appropriate it's not the kind of people we are period I don't really have anything more to say about that if you didn't see my comments on that or why we weren't going to uh, engage in the debate you can see that I think on our on our on the like page which is the public page for the CCFR I think it was on there or you can see it on my personal wall. I think it's public, uh, or you can see it in the closed group, which I think a lot of people listening to this podcast are members of. So, and so I laid it out in there. I'm not going to talk about that any further. Now, what I did do when this happened is I sat down 
and made a um, a talking point sheet and what are all our you know I produced a, a sheet that has all our positions on all of the the different uh, issues. Should we have a request at some point starting sort of now um, on the shooting and what the CCFR thinks? And there's always this gun debate that follows shootings in the U.S. So we want to be prepared for that. And also so that there was some cohesive nature in the way that we see things at the CCFR, primarily between me and Tracy Wilson, in case either of us had to do any kind of public interview or public discussion. So I wanted to share a couple of the points on this sheet with you guys, because you are going to have to get into these baits probably on a personal level or on social media. And I just wanted to uh, share a little bit of this uh, with you. So. Um, I have some key considerations and I always put these down there almost as a reference to myself and it's to keep your answers short if you're debating with people. You don't want to go on and on because especially when you're dealing with completely hysterical, irrational people, they just don't have the attention span to deal with, you know, too many facts or too much truth because two things are happening. You're giving them facts that undermine their position very clearly and you're getting real with them and usually people are hysterical and they can't they can't handle getting real too much right it 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 shakes the foundations of their uh you know of their their world view and that's really difficult and you get you get a lot of violent reaction with people when you do that so you want to keep it short you want to be as kind as you can with them and be the calm voice in the room you don't want to speculate too much because speculation always leads you away from facts and it always it drags you right down the rabbit hole and you're like you know at some point in the conversation you're like how did i get here you know, I do that when I talk, when I'm talking like this, you know, was bad enough when I'm trying to do a podcast and I do it, um, you know, by myself. So try to try to stay on track. Don't speculate. Stick with the facts, because that's the only way that we're going to solve any of these problems to begin with these societal problems, really. Right. Uh, also, qualify your answer. I always use like in my opinion or personally, you know, my opinion of this is or personally, I think because some things aren't facts. And they're just your assessment of the situation. So I try to be as fair as I can and say, hey, this is my opinion, you know, Um, and or or in in considering these facts, my opinion or my conclusion is X. Well, my conclusion is still my opinion. So I try not to be too sanctimonious as some people are. They're just like guns equal death. And you're like, well, hold on. Is that your opinion or is that a fact? (laughs) Certainly their opinion. And it's meaningless because it's not backed by facts. So I know that's kind of a roundabout way to explain my position on that, but hopefully that makes some sense because I'm rambling, I'm ranting. And also what I like to do when I'm debating with people is I call, I call them out. I'm like, listen, are you interested in solving the problem or do you, are you interested in just having conflict with somebody like, no, I mean, I care about the good. I care too. So what that's going to require is for us to have this calm, rational conversation and for us to distinguish between our opinions and what, what is fact. So if you're interested in doing that, I'm right here. I am interested in having this conversation with you. I think we can accomplish something, but we're going to have to dial back the ad hominem attacks. We're going to have to dial back the, the course language and the, and the, the personal insults. Cause that's not, that's not going to, that's not going to work. So if you're really interested in that, let me know. Cause if you are, I'm here with you. And every time they move off, you know, they start going down the road because they get frustrated. Just bring them back with that. Put the, put the, give them the responsibility, make them accountable for their own behavior. That's what I, I try to do. I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, but that's what I try to do. So one of the questions that gets asked, I was asked this, uh, in an interview with uh, a CBC, um, station in, in Quebec. And this was about a year ago. And it was, it was about, you know, this, I think it was called law six or something like that. It was for the Dawson. It was a result of the shooting at, at Dawson college. And, you know, it was such effective legislation uh, for stopping multiple victim public shootings as you can't license gun owners cannot now legally transport their firearms on public tra- on public transit. So this is this is <laughs> this is them solving the problem. You know, anyway, uh, that was part of it. So at the end of the so, of course, I said, this is is this a real discussion? Um you know, is somebody is anyone really trying to stop multiple victim public shootings, or are we just you know wasting time here, kind of thing? But at the very end of the of the uh, of the interview, of course, they always throw this to try to turn a gun owner, and in this case, me into some kind of cold monster, horrible creature. And they go, well, what do you think of you know what happened at Dawson College, or in the context of of this shooting, they go, well, what do you think of the events of this past week? And my answer is like, I don't know why I wouldn't uh, feel any differently than anybody else, any other human being, you know, does it have to do with the fact that I own guns that I would feel differently or I would be, you know, less, uh, 
you know, less compassionate about people being shot for absolutely no reason for a- attending a-, a-, a country music concert or any other event? Is that is that the assertion here? Is that what you're implying? You know, I'll throw it back at them because it's such a ridiculous question. Um, you don't have to get nasty, but I think that that's a-, a good way to articulate that. And should you have to provide an analogy, I think this is one of my favorite ones is, huh, I would throw this at somebody like, as someone who drinks alcohol, and I don't know how regularly you do, but as someone that drinks alcohol, do you feel, um, how do you feel about that whole family that was killed in that drinking driving accident, you know, three, three, three months ago? Like, are you going to continue to drink alcohol? And how do you feel about what happened? Like, do you hold some responsibility for that drinking driving accident? Because you're obviously a promoter um, of alcohol and the use thereof, which I might add is not needed. Like, why do you need alcohol? You don't actually need it. And it causes a lot. Of, what did somebody, somebody put a, a, a comment in the Facebook group, 88,000 uh, Americans die each year as a result of some alcohol related, you know, accident or, or crime. And 33,000 people die of firearm wounds. The overwhelming majority of those obviously being suicides, but you know, but you don't need alcohol because it always comes back to why do you need a military style assault weapon, which is, oh, you mean just a regular semi-automatic rifle? So anyway, those are some good analogies, hopefully, that you can use should you get embroiled in this uh, ridiculous debate. It's a fact that licensed gun owners do not represent a disproportionate risk to public safety. Yet whether it's backdoor gun registries, complex regulations, or unreasonable penalties for paperwork offenses, Canada's anti-gun bureaucrats will never stop trying to eliminate your will or ability to own and use firearms. Take action. Take a stand and join the Canadian Coalition for Firearm Rights by visiting us at www.firearmrights.ca. Another thing that tends to get asked is, is it too easy to get a gun in the U.S.? And should we make it harder here in Canada, too, to avoid these types of of things? So I want to pass on just a little bit of information. I'm going to try to rattle it off quick. I'm not an expert on firearm laws in the United States. I think I know about 90 percent, I'd say 95 percent of what there is to know. But I'm I'm not I'm not going to call myself an expert. Now, in this particular situation, we think that there were full autos used or as information leaks out there was a bump fire stock which is just a semi semi-automatic rifle and then a stock with a big spring in there to cause the um using the recoil of the, of the firearm to to make you pull the trigger quick more quickly so i don't know what happened but let's just say it was full autos okay so in the united states just so you know full automatics are um, are a class three firearm these are the most tightly controlled firearms in the united states in fact i will tell you this class three firearms are more are more tightly controlled in the united states than restricted firearms are controlled in canada okay this is this is a fact all right just so you know to get a class three firearm in the united states only certain ones are available to you and um, you need a, a firearms license, a class three firearms license. And just to apply for that firearms license, there's a $200 uh, application fee. And as long as you hold that class three firearms license in the United States, it's $500 a year. Okay. So they made it very, very expensive as is one of the fire, uh, one of the gun control methods or strategies here in Canada is to make the whole process expensive. So poor people or people that don't have as much financial means don't have access to firearms. Wonderful. Hey, so anyway, that's what they're doing in the United States. Now to get that class three firearms license, you have to um, make an application. You have to pay for that. Obviously you have a 60 day waiting period, which is over twice as long as the waiting period is in Canada. And you have a face to face interview for approval. I think it's it with uh, the ATF or the Department of Homeland Security. I, I don't know which is which because I've never gone through that application process, but a face to face interview, which exceeds Canadian uh, standards and your fingerprinted, which can exceeds Canadian standards and the uh, the um, all the guns, the the class three firearms are registered. So it is kind of the the gun controllers wildest dream utopian gun control that they would talk about in Canada. And the whole point is, what did it do to stop a multiple victim public shooting in the United States, the worst one in U.S. history? It did precisely and absolutely nothing. It did zero to prevent or even delay it, right? Because this guy apparently, so, so we're told, was in the hotel since Thursday. 
So he wasn't in any hurry. So the delay, even the, the, the 60 day waiting period, if he had a, a class three firearms license, we don't know, but that didn't do anything. Well, he was patient. So anyway, it's, it's, this is a case study. So in fact, when it says, is it too, you know, when people say, is it too easy to get a gun in Canada? We need to make it harder. It's like, listen, you have a blaring case study um, that was, you know, obtained through the, the, the slaughter of innocent people, no less. So you know what, when this message comes to you, why don't you listen to it? It came at the expense of all these people that were hurt and killed to tell you that gun control does nothing. You know, if you really want to solve the problem, and I assure you, we do, I don't want to see people shot. If you really want to solve the problem, then we better get real and have a real conversation about what causes multiple victim public shootings. I might even submit to you that it's not gun control that's going to stop this or the accessibility of guns in the United States. There's 300 million guns there. In Canada, we think there's around 20 million guns. There's no problem. Whether there's laws or not, people that want to do harm will access guns. So it's just gun control is just not a, it's not an option. I'm sorry. And I'm sorry to be the one to break that to you. It's just not an option. It's not doing anything. Okay. So what are the real causes of multiple victim public shootings? If you truly care? Well, the real causes I'll tell you, is it mental illness? What's causing these people to break? Is it political or religious ideology? We've seen that in the near, in the, in the, in the, uh, the near past, right? Is it the politicization of everything? Okay. The constant polarization, uh, the, the tribalism, you know, the racial division and all of this stuff. I'm not going to, I'm not going to get too political with you guys, but this is not rocket science and you really don't need me to tell you it's the media and governments that are pushing the division of all of us in, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, along sexual and gender lines, along racial lines, along ideological lines, along political lines. They just, they are pushing it so hard. I, I mean, you, do you need, if you need something to back that up, I'll tell you what, I'm living in a time and I've been around for a while. I'm living in a time where if you disagree with somebody about anything, like literally about anything, about who uses what bathroom, if you disagree, you're actually called a Nazi. Okay, if you're if you've been around a while, you know what a real Nazi is. That's what you're called. So do you think that this might have an effect on people thinking, you know what, I don't even want to live in this world anymore. It's just too crazy. Or people that are are mentally unstable to begin with. Maybe this is what pushes them over the edge. They look at everybody as an enemy. And you know what? I'm I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna mince words. The media has a huge part to play. They have serious and direct accountability for this, for this craziness. And, you know, but no, let's, let's blame gun owners instead. So this is, this is completely ridiculous. The politicization of everything too. It's relentless. You can't even watch a football game without having to get embroiled in a debate about, about police brutality and race. You can't even watch, you can't even go watch a football game to escape it. And what about the economy? What about how competitive the world is right now where young people growing up are complete, are jobless. They can't make any money. And there's so many people, you know, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting four people with a double master's degree, you know, and it makes for a very, it makes it very difficult for young people to have hope. And when you have no hope, what do you have left? And then on top of that, this polarizing uh, environment makes it that we can't have conversations anymore. We can't sit down and talk with each other. And the thing is, when you remove, when you call people a Nazi and you remove the um the option to have a conversation what's left if there if you if you don't have the op the option to talk what's left is violence so anyway i know this was a very long answer and i appreciate you guys hanging in with me here but i mean to me and it's just my opinion this is the real reason why you have multiple victim public shootings it's the the fact that people have no hope and they have other problems as well stacked on top of it so and why do, why do i have to answer as a gun owner i just don't believe that i do so anyway, these are some of the concepts that you can use in these conversations. Don't forget, if you are embroiled in a conversation about gun control, you always use the explainer videos and use the reference material at gundebate.ca. That's why we created it. The members, the paying members of the CCFR expended a lot of money creating these resources for you. So please don't, don't forget to use them. And they are incredibly effective. All right, I'm going to wrap up this, uh, this week's uh, uh, CCFR radio podcast, just hang in there, share this podcast, uh, you know, do your best to represent gun owners in, in the most uh, positive possible light you can in these hard times. There's a lot more coming up, uh, both on the gun control front, 
Uh, there's a lot more coming up as far as what the CCFR is doing. Make sure you become a member. Make sure you support a gun organization, um, no matter who it is. And uh, keep the faith, people. We will see you in a couple of weeks. This is another episode of the CCFR Radio Podcast. Remember, if you don't stand up for your own ability to own and use firearms, who will? Join the CCFR or donate right now at www.firearmrights.ca.